It's bad news, good news, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. Slightly negative, the countdown to the Open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. Next up, payrolls. The jobs report coming out on Friday. U.S. labor market data on Friday. All eyes will be on non-farm payrolls. Two to 300,000 would be great if we're still adding two to 300,000 jobs a month. That is an extraordinarily resilient labor market. To get the Fed to uh, pause, you need job growth to slow to at least 100,000 uh, a month. The jolt number was yeah. uh, worse than expected. It is, of course, encouraging to see some early signs of weakness. So. Bad news is good news. They think the Fed will, you, will, will give them relief. They are talking very tough. They're stick, sticking to a script. The Fed is f feeling the pressure. But how strong they'll be if that data rolls over, I don't know about that. Maybe we're going into one of these periods where it's like bad news is good news. We're going to talk about that right now with RBC's Laurie Cavacina, Morgan Stanley's Brian Weinstein. It drives us all nuts, Laurie. But is it true? <laughs> it's bad news, good news. It drives me nuts too, John, um, but I think that's the mode we're in right now. And you know, it's interesting as we've been looking at the jobless claims this morning, one of the things we've been thinking about is how if you look at the S&P, you look at the Russell 2000, they tend to trend in terms of performance year over year with year over year trends in jobless claims. And if I were able to show you the chart right now, John, you'd see that the market, both small and large, are already baking in a pretty big pickup in jobless claims from here. Um, so I think that's something else to keep in the back of your mind. This has been pretty well anticipated. Brian, your take on that. Yeah, I agree. It's been anticipated. I, what I would think about, John, is that at some point, the Fed has to stop going 75 basis points a clip. Um, and I don't know that they need a big excuse for that. So maybe this payroll mm -hmm. isn't as important as some of the others. Bad news is good news. Maybe it helps them. But the Fed is going to start to talk about a slower pace, and the market may very well like that. Is decelerating rate hikes, Laurie, sufficiently positive for you to underpin a durable gain in this market? I think that, you know, we've already had with the lows that we made, you know, kind of that break below the June lows, kind of the, the hawkish Fed for a bit longer has already been baked in. So it may be enough at this point. Um, frankly, John, as you know, sort of the talk about the pivot emerges, I don't know if you necessarily need a pivot at this point. You may just need the pause. You can pause and the economy can get worse. And by definition, you're tighter, aren't you, Brian? Isn't that problematic? Um, it's problematic, but it's probably better than continuing to hike and, and, and knowing it's a lag. You get lagging results. Um, so you slow down. Uh, you hope that things get stronger. Not that hope is a great strategy, but it's better than, than raising rates a lot. And we've done a lot of work in, in interest rates, right? I think the interest rate high quality portion of fixed income is it will attract capital and slow down some of these hotter flows. Well, Brian, let's talk about that. The last time you were on, you said rates have not found their high. That was a while ago. Then the 10-year breached 4%. And before we got to 4%, you also said that you'd be leaning in when we got to 4%. So what are you doing now? What's special about 4 yeah, we're, we're leaning in. I, I like leaning in. What's special about four is that I think it gives you some some wiggle room. It gives you some some coupons, some income. Listen, I'm not calling for tenure notes to go back to two. I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think what it gives you is a chance to hide out, um, earn some 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 income as inflation falls, maybe get some capital appreciation. Um, and the hard work here has been done by treasuries and gilts and bunds and and and, and investment grade credit. And so you can actually buy quality things and actually uh, earn some return first time in a very long time. Well, let me ask you this question then. What are you more confident about? That the 10-year yield has peaked or that the whites are in in credit? If I had to choose one, I would say 10-year yields have peaked. And that would be the sequence of things, wouldn't it? You'd see the peak on a 10-year yield and then you see the whites come in in the credit market. So, Brian, where are the whites in high-yield credit? Listen, I think there's an increasing chance that we've gotten there. I, I'm not confident in that. I, you know, I think we've had some, some finally some less orderly moves. Um, but I still think you haven't seen the earnings pain. You haven't seen uh, the results of all the Fed hikes and tighter FCI. Um, so I, I think we still need to see the real economic pain that's coming before you see the wise and credit spreads. Laurie, can you call the bottom in the equity market before we see the wides in credit? Well, you can call the bottom in the equity market before you see the washout on earnings. I mean, that's something that we're comfortable saying. Um, we've seen consistently in big crises and big kind of economic challenge periods that markets 
it's typically bought about three to six months before the earnings do. Now, in terms of the credit spreads, you know, we do watch high yield credit spreads pretty closely uh, when it comes to small cap performance. And I think small cap is an important barometer for the broader market as well. But I tell you, John, when I put the issue of spreads aside, um, we do take some comfort in the fact that small caps tend to start outperforming midway through a recession when unemployment rate starts to move up. So, you know, I do feel st still feel very, very comfortable telling people to jump on that small cap trade. But I do admit, you know, that the spreads are an issue. Let me ask both of you if you're comfortable with this, this language that President Bostic used in a speech yesterday evening. If economic conditions weaken appreciably, for example, if unemployment rises uncomfortably, it will be important to resist the temptation to react by reversing our policy course prematurely. I've asked this question, Laurie, about 15 different ways over the last couple of weeks. I think the market's very preoccupied with asking the question, what would it take the Fed to stop hiking? That's bullish. I wonder when we get to this point, when we start to realise that if we get a recession, there will be some people on the committee arguing that we don't cut rates. There will be no rate cuts in a recession. What would that mean to the equity market, Laurie? So look, I think that if you go back to 2018 and we go back to that December moment, and we've been thinking about this quite a bit, I think the idea that policy was on autopilot was what really unsettled markets. And so I think, you know, if there is a debate at the Fed and there are people who are pushing to stay restrictive, of course the markets aren't going to like that. But you do need to look at the balance of comments. You know, I like it when I hear Fed officials talk about data dependency. Um, I think there's a view among a lot of equity market participants that they are not going to be able to withstand the political pressure if the employment data gets too bad. Um, so, you know, I think it could contribute to volatility, but I do think, frankly, John, we are in store for kind of this extended bottoming process. So it all kind of adds up to me uh, and makes sense to me that if we get that debate, it could contribute to that further volatility. Okay. We might not make new lows on it, but it could keep things uh, feeling pretty lousy. That's the struggle, Brian. I think we're always arguing, mm -hmm. where does the counter cyclical circuit breaker come from? Laurie mentioned 2018, the Fed backed away. The rate cuts weren't too far behind. I just wonder where it comes from and what brings it around. It's not coming from fiscal policymakers anytime soon, and the Fed arguably wants the weakness that is materializing at the moment. So where does it come from? You know, I, I think it comes from, from time and, uh, and ability to prove that inflation is actually really coming down. By the way, I think energy complicates this, right? Energy is a tax on the consumer, but it also embeds the idea that prices are going up again, and, and the Fed doesn't want that. So I think they're going to push against this idea that they, they're going to ease quickly. It's why I like the idea of income over capital appreciation, right? I think going out the yield curve, um, earning income, the curves could really invert further. This is not a great entry point, but, but they could keep inverting as the Fed fights this idea that they're going to come to the rest you save asset prices, create inflation. So I think, John, it's, it's time. They really need to make sure they beat this inflation genie back into the bottle. And Brian, you were leaning into a tenure at 4%. Are you still leaning into that call that we could get twos, tens at negative 100? I, I, I am. I mean, again, I want, as, if the Fed, if people read the Fed slowing down as a, as a pause, then we'll, we'll steepen again. So again, I think you'll have a chance. But I like buying longer duration things. It's been a terrible, the worst year ever for long duration quality assets. Um, and I, I think we've moved further there than we have in, say, the two-year note, where the Fed could keep rates here or higher for, for a long time. So yes, I think we can still get there. I've got a long list of people that share your view, particularly on the 10-year and that 4% number. We've had a lot of pushback in the last couple of days from Fed speakers. The San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly no different. Take a listen to this. I don't see that happening at all. I see us as raising to a level that we believe is restrictive enough to bring inflation down and then holding it there until we see inflation truly get close to 2% and, and demonstrate that price stability is restored. Kelly Lines, they have zero interest signaling rate cuts anytime soon. No, they don't. And I would bet that the chorus of Fed speakers we're going to hear from today, including Mester, Waller, Kashkari, Evans, Cook, all will be singing a very similar tune because it wasn't just Mary Daly yesterday. You also had Raphael Bostic speaking, saying, yes, I want to get to between four and four and a half percent by the end of this year. But we also need to hold it there and see how things evolve, how the economy and prices react. And he literally said, and this is a quote, you are no doubt aware of considerable speculation already that the Fed could begin lowering rates in 2023. I would say not so fast. And yet the market is saying, nope, we're going fast because bets on, bets on a rate cut next year are still alive and well. The market's still pricing in one cut for 2023 with at least two more priced in for 2024. Essentially not buying the idea that the Fed isn't going to blink if the economy softens and cracks start to form and things start to break. And of course, the labor market is going to be critical 
in the evolution of that thinking. The Fed would like to see more slack forming, demand for labor going down, and a tick up in jobless claims this morning and the jolts data we got earlier this week in which we saw about a million fewer job openings here in the U.S. would lend support to the idea that that is starting to happen. But does that mean that employers had more success hiring or just decided to stop trying to hire? We might get a clue on that tomorrow when we get the September jobs report. 275,000 on non farm payrolls is what we're looking for. 3.7 percent on the unemployment rate. But that is the question, John. How high does that unemployment rate go? And when we get there, is the Fed really going to tolerate it? How high does it need to go? Kelly Lights, thank you. We'll catch up with Michael McKee a little bit later this hour on job losses. Brian, I want to talk to you about this, and forgive me, because it involves mind reading to some degree. Do you think there's a difference between what some of these Fed officials want to signal and what they actually know they will do when that weakness starts to materialize? Yes. I mean, the, the, the Fed's playing two different games, right? They, they need to play this inflation expectations fighting role, but they also have to be intelligent, data, you know, reactive, um, forward-looking uh, humans as well. So, uh, again, they have other tools, right? They can stop uh, QT. Uh, we just saw it with the Bank of England. If things got unstable, they could buy long-term assets, right? They don't have to ease in order to uh, and make things better. So, I think they know their tools. I think they're comfortable with them. I think they're comfortable with what they're doing. I think they believe it for now, but they know that this could turn on a dime, and, and so they're willing to do what they need to do. And that pricing and eases next year isn't crazy, but they should absolutely fight against it. And Laurie, I sense from you that perhaps mind reading Fed officials is a game that you don't want to play. I, I think it's an exercise in futility, to be honest, John, and I know we all have to play it to some extent, um, but I think the reality is, is that we do have people at the Fed who are going to pay attention to the data. And as I talk to investors, and I've been traveling the country the last few weeks, um, you know, I still get a lot of questions from equity people about what do different components of inflation look like? I mean, there is still a real attention and there's a real sensitivity to the idea in the equity investment community that inflation, the, the sort of seeds of moderation have been planted. And you have to think that the Fed is going to pay attention to the data that's incoming. And I think that's a reasonable assumption. Laurie, are they more worried about inflation than they are about losing their job? That was something Mary Daly talked about. Is that your sense of things too? Of losing their own jobs or losing or, or well, people that's, losing that's, jobs. That's the problem. It's always a soft <laughs> landing when it's someone else's job, isn't it? Unfortunately, that's the language that's used. Right. You know, I think we're, you know, and I hate to even spark this conversation, but I think we're getting into territory, right, where we were talking about what does transitory mean before um, the kind of idea of uncomfortably high. Um, you know, what is the level of uncomfort, of discomfort that the Fed is willing to tolerate? I think that's going to be the next big question that comes into play. Um, but I have to think at the end of the day that this whole inflation issue got started uh, because of the concern that it was having on the broader economy and individuals and consumers. And I do think those consumers and those individuals um, are at the forefront of their minds. Laurie, Brian, you're going to be sticking with us. We've got to talk about the energy market as well. Futures right now, negative about a third of 1% on the S&P, 18 minutes away from the opening bell. Coming up, OPEC Plus delivering a 2 million barrel blow to the White House. I don't want people to uh, uh, think that uh, this is a one-way street. In this case, no. It's a variety of convoluting uncertainties. That conversation, up next. Massacres, or I, I said this, <laughs> but uh, I, I was talking about more to do with making sure that we have disciplined market, a market that serves its original purposes, which is a market that has sufficient liquidity. Uh, that liquidity has been hampered by extreme volatility. Uh, extreme volatility, unfortunately, bring premiums to become very expensive. OPEC Plus delivering its biggest supply cut since the pandemic, 2 million barrels per day. The U.S. slamming the decision. We were disappointed uh, that oh, uh, OPEC uh, made this decision. It's unnecessary if you look at the global environment where supply continues to be the predominant challenge. The White House making good on another SPR release by the tune of 10 million barrels, adding in a statement the following. The Biden administration will also consult with Congress on additional tools and authorities to reduce OPEC's control over energy prices. Team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Javier Blas in London. Anne-Marie down in D.C. Javier, what happened here? 
Well, it was a very surprising move because OPEC is cutting production with Brent crude nearly at $100. This is the typical scenario where you will expect in OPEC to be adding production. And I hear the concern by Prince Abdulaziz, the Saudi oil minister, about an incoming recession and what it will do to that for the oil market. We have seen it in the past, 1997, 2008, 2020, very recently. But there are a lot of counterbalancing forces against that, uh, that impact on demand. We don't have a big reaction from non-OPEC supply. If we look at U.S. shale, it's not growing as in the past. Uh, inventories remain very low. And the European sanctions against Russian oil are about to start in uh, about six weeks. All of that will have given time OPEC to react. Why now? Why precisely four weeks ahead of the mid-term elections? It's a puzzling decision to me. AMH, talk to me about the timing and the optics here. The timing and the optics are incredibly challenging and really a blow to this White House. You look at the timing, as Javier just said, we are just weeks out from the midterm elections. While the administration has worked to get gas prices lower, as they remind you every day, the fact is, especially in western United States, you are starting to see prices tick up. Of course, as well, this is on the heels of the president making a landmark trip to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where he fist pumped bumped the uh, crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who's now the prime minister uh, uh, as well, uh, Mohammed bin Salman. And then uh, you have to add on top of the fact that the United States has been rallying their Western alliance partners to make sure they are having these repercussions and sanctions on Moscow due to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And yet what you have is a decision that is going to help Russia. And at the same time, it was an in-person decision, which we have not seen since the pandemic. Everything up until this point at OPEC has been virtual. And on top of that, that means the deputy prime minister, Alexander Novak, was there in person, and he was just days off a sanctions list out of the United States. Javier, I want your thoughts on the SPR. I had someone reach out this morning to me on Twitter, the handle, hyperconvexity, calling it the strategic midterm reserve. <laughs> your thoughts on that, Javier, just how the SPR is being used ahead of the midterms? Well, it's true that uh, there is a political upside for the White House to use the SPR. And, and I know that a lot of people, not just on social media, but on Wall Street, think that what, what was going on. But also, if we look at the, at the American oil market, if it has not been by the decision of the White House to release the SPR, uh, American commercial crude inventories will have absolutely collapsed. Uh, last summer, and we will have much higher oil prices, much higher gasoline prices, and certainly a much bigger inflation problem, not just in the United States, but around the world. So I don't think that it was just about politics. Um, the main problem now is that you are fighting a flow, the flow of barrels from OPEC, with a finite stock, which is what's left on the SPR. And it's not a lot left. Can the White House order further uh, releases from the SPR over the next few months? Yes, it can. But there is not a lot, and certainly they are not going to be as large as they were uh, in, through this year in 2022. Javier Blas, Anne-Marie, to the two of you, thank you. Brian Weinstein, I want your thoughts on this. Uh, I'm not going to ask for your view on the strategic midterm reserve, but I will ask for your view on the energy market and what it means for your call going forward from here. Yeah, listen, there's so many uncertainties out there, and that's one of them. <laughs> and obviously, Europe is a mess. Um, the situation in Russia is, is going to be with us for a while. And so you end up in a world where it, it makes the Fed's job impossible. It's going to slow growth. Um, it's going to cause the consumer to feel like inflation is going up no matter what uh, what the Fed does. Um, and, and it's going to slow growth, I think, right? Input, input costs are going to go up, and I'm not sure you can keep passing them on. Uh, so it, it makes me like, again, that longer-term fixed income stuff a little bit more. Um, but it also makes me worried the Fed is going to have to raise rates more or at least stay stickier to convince people that that inflation, that, that, that prices aren't going to go up ad infinitum. It's really a difficult place for the Fed to be, and energy makes it that much more complicated. Jeff Curry of Goldman have said a few times over the last 12 months, this is the revenge of the old economy. Laurie, that we had zero interest rates for so long that everyone chased long duration assets. They invested a ton of money in things like Peloton, food delivery apps, car services, Uber, all of the above. And we didn't invest in digging holes in the ground and mining after the bust of China 10 years ago. Laurie, with that in mind, I think people might be hesitant tactically to invest in the energy names going into an economic downturn. Talk to me about the structural story and the tailwind that might persist through next year and beyond. 
Well, look, I think that, you know, in terms of we haven't we haven't drilled, we're not able to drill enough, right? We have these shortages there. Um, I absolutely agree with Curry's assessment. And I think, you know, we're hearing about this kind of revenge of the old economy, not just on the energy and materials complex, but we also hear it in terms of industrials and the need to reshore in America. Um, and we're hearing a lot of talk about those as longer term themes going forward. And I think for right now, you know, I think the energy stocks are still cheap. Um, it's really where the earnings power in the market is because of these structural dynamics. Um, and so I think that this is still a sector that you can invest in for now. It's been orphaned for quite some time, but we are seeing that re-engagement trade come back. And John, if I could talk about the strategic midterm reserve for just a minute, you know, I think that the Fed is not the only variable here. Um, I was getting pretty excited, you know, when I was hearing Anne-Marie um, and Javier talk earlier. But if you think about, you know, kind of something else that's going on in the market right now, those gas prices that were coming down were helping Biden's polling numbers. And so as we've started to see gas prices come back up again, um, and you know, with this cut that we've got now, I think that actually uh, does something very important for equity markets in the short term, which is throw some momentum back in the direction of Republicans right now. Um, you know, we've started to see in some of the polling data that the Democrats are not doing as well in the generic congressional ballot. Republicans have perked back up in the real clear politics data. Um, and that tailwind from gas prices coming down that had really helped the Democrats Democrats and all these polling and the betting markets in recent months, that seems to be dissipating. And if Republicans do set up for a good midterms, that's going to be good for the equity market in the short term, despite how it complicates the Fed narrative. Laurie, we're going to talk more about that, no doubt, in weeks to come. Looking forward to doing that with you. Laurie Cavasini there and Brian Weinstein on the strategic midterm reserve. What a phrase. Quite enjoying that, to be honest with you. The S&P 500, energy stocks on that, up more than 12% over the previous three days. Year to date, up around about 45%. Coming up in the morning calls and later, crude heading for a fourth day of gains. Wall Street charting the path to triple digits for longer. That conversation with Francisco Blanche of Bank of America coming up very, very shortly. Looking forward to that too. From New York City with futures, negative on the S&P 500 through much of this morning. We're down about a third of 1%. The opening bell, seven minutes away. About five minutes away from the up and it back. Good morning to you. Futures just about negative, down four tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a third of one percent. That's the price action. Here are some morning calls. Three of them. Your first one from J.P. Morgan, upgrading Credit Suisse to neutral, saying the company is worth at least 15 billion U.S. more than the market is currently pricing. That stock is up this morning by more than three percent. Oppenheimer upgrading Verizon to outperform 50 dollar price target, anticipating a gradual return to subscriber growth. That stock is negative, just about by a tenth of one percent. And finally. Piper Sandler raising its Philips 66 price target to 116, expecting refiners to remain a bright spot heading into Q3 earnings. That stock is negative a third of 1%. Coming up, oil prices surging over the last few days after OPEC's production cut. That conversation coming up next with Bank of America's Francisco Blanche. Looking forward to that. You're opening bow just around the corner with futures down around about four tenths of 1% on the S&P. We're down 16 points. The opening bow up next. Four seconds away from the up and about this morning. Good morning, some calm. On the edge of snoozing, just a little bit. Relative to what we have seen, futures down by about a third of 1%. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a third of 1%. Also, on a Russell, the small caps, down about a half of 1%. We'll talk a lot about crude this morning. We'll do that in just a moment with Francisco Blanche of Bank of America after a big rally for the commodity and the energy names as well. Switch to the board and get to the bond market. Yields look a little something like this on a 10-year. Yields up two basis points, 377 on a 10-year yield. A week ago, Wednesday, we were three, four percent. We come down a little bit. Brian Weinstein earlier this morning from Morgan Stanley talking about leaning in to four percent, and he's done just that. In the FX market, dollar strength back on a table. Euro dollar down a half of one percent, 98. 33. Crude down about a tenth of 1%. 87.65. I think they're cheering for the New York Rangers at Ludlow. I'm told that's ice hockey, right? I, I know that before anyone writes in. I know that's ice hockey. Never seen the game, but I'm told I should go and watch. Thank you. The S&P 500 opening lower by a third of 1% with some movers. Here's Abby. Well done. Uh, the Rangers certainly one of my favorite teams. I'm glad that you know that it's ice hockey. And we do have stocks down for a second day in a row, putting this week's 
rally earlier in the week on pause. One of the big stock stories, of course, Twitter. It is down, or at least the last time I looked, because it's well off the lows. Earlier in the session, it had been down sharply, down more than 1%, suggesting that the deal may not be done. And, of course, the litigation has not been called off by other side. It could, in fact, begin on October 17th. So the overhang risk uh, does remain there. BP down 2.6%, an exaggerated move of what is happening uh, with oil at this point, which is basically flat, but the energy sector uh, is lower. Conagra up slightly. It had been up more than 1%, a strong quarter there for the packaged food company. They beat revenues by 2.4%, adjusted earnings by 8 0.9%. Higher prices helped this company, and they did maintain the outlook, so a, a rare winner. And then finally, I know that uh, Ed will be talking more about the story here, but Peloton flipping all over the map right now, down about 1%. They're, of course, cutting uh, 500 jobs to save the company. What I want to talk about more, John, is the price action. It is down 70% from the IPO. Of course, the CEO saying they have to do this action to save the company and that within six months, down 95% from its peak. Put another way, this stock had been a $171 stock not so long ago, not so much now. Abby, thank you. Some headlines for you. Not a surprise. We've seen this a few times this week. You'll hear from Neil Kashkari a few times just today. The Minneapolis Fed president saying we are quite a ways away from a pause in rate hikes. More pushback from them once again. Not seeing evidence that underlying inflation has peaked. Very confident the Fed will get inflation under control. They have more work to do, and that's what the IMF chief wants to see. Some headlines from her just moments ago. Urging policymakers to stay the course to ease inflation. Going on to say the global situation likely to worsen before improving. Unsurprisingly, I think we're going to get some estimate cuts from them as well in the next week or so. There are the headlines for you in the last couple of minutes. The S&P down by around about two-tenths of one percent. No real drama here. Ed Ludlow, we're not going to talk about sport, OK, because your Chelsea beat my AC Milan. We are going to talk about job cuts, though. We'll leave it be. Let's Just dig into the micro, there. shall Just we? Don't go yeah. there. I mean, look, I'm looking at Peloton announcing another 500 job cuts, taking layoffs to date this year to 4,600. They basically cut half of the workforce in their pursuit of break-even cash flow. Um, that having an effect on the stock, as Abby said, I think we're down 90% over the last 12 months or so. Interesting on Amazon, this is a, com a company as well that really had scaled back its investment uh, and undone some of the pandemic era restructuring. And now it's saying it's going to add 150,000 employees bracing for the holiday season. The holiday season, of course, also coincides with a very key earnings season. I think we've got to get back to the conversation around how the earnings outlook continues to be revised. And if you look, for example, at the Citigroup Global Earnings Revision Index, we're down for a 17th straight week. Those expectations continue to fall. And in terms of the third quarter specifically, this is my world. We're looking at communications and technology in terms of the biggest year-on-year -year decline in EPS. There is a bright spot, though. Did you see that note from Citigroup strategists led by Rob Buckland saying that they actually favour tech going into recession and that they've lifted global tech to overweight because, frankly, they think that EPS will hold up better in a global recession? How many times have we said strong balance sheets in trench market position? Does that help? We'll find out. Congratulations. Return leg next week? We'll do the return leg next week. We'll do the return right. leg next week. Thanks, Ed. Come on Thank shelves. you very much. Not quite. Not on this programme. Anyway, big tech, information technology right now up two-tenths of one percent. Energy stocks over the last few days have absolutely ripped. That's been a major story for us, that's for sure. Taylor Riggs, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, John, I think this is interesting. The big headline for me that stood out this morning is here's what Goldman to UBS are all saying about the big uh, OPEC plus production cuts as of yesterday. And a majority of the analysts, John, now looking at Brent reaching $100 a barrel a lot faster and sooner than had originally projected. So this sets up the narrative of maybe a drop in global supply, but also maybe a drop in demand as well. If you're thinking about some uh, slowing economic pressures as well. These are some of the big energy stocks that are getting a little bit of a boost on that. Interestingly, we're going to dive into Shell. They're off 5.5% this morning. Coming up with an update uh, this morning, and the street, the majority of them looking at this as being a weak guidance. Jefferies is one looking at significantly lower trading contributions. Upstream production guidance is lower. Margins in the chemicals division also lower. So, facing some input cost headwinds as well as margins are pressured. Finally, John, just change up the board, and it has been the story of the day, the story of the year. Energy is just a massive outperformer. Uh, you see that again as everything else has just been a little bit lower, but energy is still the winner. Can you hear the window cleaning? 
I know, is that what that is? I think we should is? address the I'm sound, trying to, you know? It's a great uh, lesson in just focus. I think you did a great job. <laughs> Kaylee Lyons is standing right by the window. Tough act to be, Kaylee. Kaylee, good luck to you. I have no idea what you're going to talk about because it's so loud. Yeah, I might it's not like hear it either. vibrating through my skull right now. But I'm going to continue talking about oil because Taylor actually teed me up perfectly talking about how all of these Wall Street strategists are now coming up and saying, yeah, we see triple digits in the near term. Morgan Stanley being one of them who says we're going to get to $100 a barrel on Brent far quicker than we thought. Goldman Sachs echoing that. They actually now are looking at 110 in the fourth quarter, raising their forecast by about 10 percent. UBS sees oil at $100 for the next several quarters as well. And their reasons all being that the production cut from OPEC Plus is just going to mean tightening the oil market even further. Restricted supply is the name of the game here. And the idea of more constrained supply has pushed oil prices higher over the last few days, not just on Brent, but WTI as well. It's up about 10 percent this week, the best week going back all the way to early March. So about seven months, though it's worth pointing out, we're still down about 30 percent from this year's peak back in March. And one final note on these production cuts. There are some analysts out there who have been quick to point out that the reduction in output Output is larger on paper than it actually will be in reality. Ed Morris at City is one of them saying the effective cut is going to be smaller because the group already is failing to reach their quotas. At RBC, they agree with that. Helena Croft over there says the actual cut will be more like a million barrels a day, with Saudi Arabia counting for more than half, John. Are they climbing through the window? I have no idea. What's I can't going see on. from here. Penny, <laughs> thank you. Francisco Blanche can't even hear this, so that's the good news. The Bank of America head of global commodities research joins us right now. Francisco, thanks for joining us. What a time for it in your world. Can you just run me through a couple of things? We'll start with the output cut from OPEC Plus. Two million to the limit for output. Can you tell me what the actual real cut is relative to what they've been producing? Um, hey, uh, John, thanks for having me again um, in the program. So, look, uh, I think on um, in terms of the, the two million headline, uh, the most likely output cut is going to be around 1.2 million barrels a day. The majority of the production curtailment uh, we think is going to be Saudi Arabia, is going to be uh, the UAE, Kuwait. So essentially, it's kind of a GCC-driven, Gulf Corporation Council-driven curtailment. Um, Russia itself is producing uh, well below their actual quotas in terms of crude oil. Um, so it's unclear how much oil the Russians will cut. Uh, but I, I do think it's, it's important to understand that, uh, that OPEC is, is sending a big signal uh, to global energy markets that uh, they don't like uh, the prices of oil, uh, essentially something they believe is uh, uh, black gold, uh, trading below the prices of other commodities, like, for example, thermal coal, which they obviously believe is uh, essentially uh, dirt. And, um, and, and that's one element, right? I think the other element is inflation. We've seen the price of oil uh, today vis-a-vis -vis where it was at the beginning of the year, more or less flat. Headline inflation has been close to 10%. So that's another reason um, for, uh, I think, the group coming in to cut. And, and, and let's not forget, I mean, OPEC is cutting because they can. Um, there is very little spare capacity. There is very little oil in strategic storage or in commercial inventories. So the group is, is uh, preempting a, a potential uh, sharper drop in oil prices if the economic situation deteriorates into uh, the first half of next year. So I think all of, all of those are, are reasons to, to kind of justify what they're doing. Um, but, uh, but importantly, uh, th there's still a big question mark how much oil uh, will leave the market once the price cap on Russian crude and products comes into effect uh, in, in early, early December for crude and in February for products. Francisco, as you know, this introduces some tension between OPEC Plus and the White House, some additional tension. Can you run us through the viable options for this White House who seem to be very, very keen at keeping oil down, gas prices at the pump low, going into the midterms? Sure. I mean, I think the, uh, the White House has, has uh, a few options. I think the most obvious one is to keep uh, depleting the strategic petroleum reserve. Um, I don't think it's uh, necessarily uh, a, a great idea, given the uh, incredibly tense geopolitical world that we live in today. Uh, but that's, uh, I think, something that could help uh, uh, prices from moving higher. Um, I, also, I also think that uh, there will be pressure, uh, maybe some legislative pressure on coming into OPEC. Uh, we've, we've heard uh, noises around that as well. Um, but ultimately, uh, I think what, what OPEC is trying to do is reassert its independence from, uh, from uh, uh, U.S. policy and uh, look after their own interests. And uh, that's what we've seen OPEC do. Um, also, clearly, Russia is the critical component of the OPEC Plus alliance, 
and they are reasserting, reasserting their, their influence in the group, which is, is essentially uh, dual-headed by uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia, but also has, of course, many other big players like Iran and, and others that are just not going to be unhappy if they get yeah. higher prices uh, for little cost. I'm not so sure why be... we're even surprised by it. The clue's in the name, OPEC Plus. The plus is, is Russia. My question right. at the moment on SPR, Francisco, I'd love your view on this, and I understand it might be delicate to talk about the politics of it, but it's clear the SPR has become politicised. We've had people call it this morning the strategic midterm reserve. Can you talk to me about the negative, unintended consequences of the politicisation of the SPR going into the midterms? Well, look, uh, uh, John, the, the most obvious uh, challenge using the SPR for political purposes is that uh, first you're depleting your research, and, uh, and every time you, you use those research for, for political reasons, you are essentially, um, you're essentially losing um, key uh, volumes that could help you if we actually do have a molecule crisis in crude oil, which, remember, we haven't had yet. Uh, today, we have the highest energy prices in the planet uh, since 1979, 1980, on average, uh, but it's mostly been a gas and power crisis. Uh, we have had no oil crisis yet. Uh, and the key word here is yet. Uh, if you lose your ability to temper price appreciation um, because there is an actual physical disruption of molecules in crude oil, uh, you're going to wish you had those barrels in store. Um, that's, I think, a big problem releasing the, the SPR right now. You're, you're essentially, um, in, in some ways, putting your hands even more so in the hands of OPEC+. Plus. So, so uh, obviously, OPEC has been unhappy about the release of SPR oil, which has been one of the factors driving prices lower. But at the same time, they're saying, well, OK, uh, you can keep doing this for a little longer, but eventually um, you're just feeding on more and more market control to the group. And, and ultimately, that's not a bad outcome either for, uh, for uh, Saudi, Russia, and the rest of the members of OPEC+. Plus. Well, Francisco, I wanted to fit in one final question, and that's next year. You don't need me to say this, but for the benefit of everyone else, policy today, as you know, shapes the crude market for years and years to come. And I look at the situation in Europe right now. They've got storage capacity up to where they want it for this winter. Their ability to repeat the act next year is going to be really difficult on the natural gas side. On the energy side, what we hear from this White House is just Band-Aid after Band-Aid after Band-Aid, blaming every single person on the planet for why crude prices are high and should be lower. Yet I don't see a change in strategy, Francisco, to shape things for years to come. The blessing this year been told this by so many people, is that China carried on with COVID zero. Because if they didn't, we'd have a much, much bigger problem. Can you run me through what 23 looks like with all of that in mind? Sure. I mean, we've talked a lot about OPEC plus reducing production as the, big, uh, as the biggest delta in terms of, of oil supply demand balances. But also, uh, to your point, uh, China this year saw a compression on oil demand of 2.5%, 400,000 barrels a day down on last year, which, by the way, makes it uh, the first and biggest compression, of course, uh, since um, uh, 2002. So the biggest compression in 20 years, uh, that's what we've seen from China. If China comes back from COVID, we are going to need a lot of oil. Our baseline is that we'll, we'll see a progressive comeback. So demand for oil in China will be above last year's level next year. And, and remember, uh, as we speak, Hong Kong is reopening uh, its economy and allowing uh, for uh, people to come in without a hotel quarantine, which has been a huge drawdown uh, on, on airlines that were operating locally, which were essentially down 90 percent in terms of flights until very recently. So that's going to lead to a big pickup, I think, in Chinese demand. Um, again, 90 percent of the growth is going to be emerging markets and, and China for next year. And, uh, and, and, and I think that the, the, the third delta here to think about is the extreme high price of, of natural gas is also leading to substitution into oil. Again, because oil is cheap. It's cheaper than coal, cheaper than gas. Uh, so that's been another factor that I think will, will likely drive prices higher next year. But, but honestly, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we are really seeing here is that unless we change our investment policy, and I don't think we're going to because of all the climate change concerns, we are really going to be in the hands of OPEC Plus for quite some time to come. And, and that, I think, is something we gotta, we got to learn how to, how to live with and, and potentially find those alternatives, uh, which I, I think through the, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, we, 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 could, we could really see some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, ultimately, uh, what, what, what this combination of factors leads us to is, is essentially fast decarbonization in the U.S., and ultimately we'll see a lot of those American hydrocarbons becoming available for export via LNG or via uh, petroleum products or crude oil. 
And I think that's the ultimate story here is the U.S. is going to transition fast into lower hydrocarbon demand domestically, but more exports if you look five years out. Uh, so not only becoming energy independent, but becoming really uh, energy dominant in the, in the global markets. And that's another reason why OPEC is getting all anxious with, with the White House too. Francisco Blanche, the conversation will continue. Just absolutely brilliant from Bank of America. Thank you, sir. Your equity market turning a little bit higher up, two tenths of 1% on the S&P. Coming up, payrolls Friday, just around the corner. Unfortunately, what Fed has set out to do is to slow down economy, uh, slow down inflation. How are we going to do it? By slowing down labor market. So we do need to see some weakness in labor market. So all eyes on payroll on Friday. And corporate America delivering cuts and hiring freezes. That conversation up next. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Jonathan Golub, Credit Suisse chief U.S. equity strategist. That conversation at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 8.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Every labor market indicator is very, very important. So we need to see, I mean, unfortunately, what Fed has set out to do is to slow down economy, uh, slow down inflation. How are we going to do it? By slowing down labor market. So we do need to see some weakness in labor market. So all eyes on payroll on Friday. Company after company is slashing its workforce. Peloton and GE, the latest to announce layoffs. The Peloton CEO saying the following, I know many of you will feel angry, frustrated, emotionally drained by today's news, but please know this is a necessary step if we are going to save Peloton, and we are. Taylor Riggs has more. Hi, Taylor. I want to get to Peloton, but I first want to focus on GE, John, as the industrial bellwether for this economy. GE, of course, also announcing about 500 layoffs in their wind turbine unit as well. That represents within the factory unit about 20% of the U.S. onshore wind workforce. So it's isolated at least to this unit. But again, it's sort of a similar story when we think about the industrial and the read on the economy. Mike McKee is going to do this next slide a lot better than I am. But this is at least one that shows Federal Reserve is sometimes too optimistic when they predict unemployment rates. So they're rising and they always end up coming in a little bit higher than they had initially projected. Of course, this year, 2022, TBD remains to be seen. Finally, I'll just end here, John, as you sure. mentioned about Peloton. So away from maybe some of the industrial outlook and the economics, but more on sort of the cyclicality of where we are in this cycle. As you mentioned, also 500 jobs trying to save the company in a six-month turnaround plan. Taylor Riggs, what a tough job in this economy as things start to roll over a little bit. Mike McKee, you were teed up nicely by Taylor Riggs. Let's talk about tomorrow's number. What are you looking for? I actually want to talk about Peloton. I haven't finished paying for mine yet, so save the company. Actually, uh, take a look at uh, what happened today with jobless claims. The market loved it because it's a bad news, good news situation with claims rising a little bit, but uh, the number of job openings is still extremely high, so the Fed sees that as okay at this point, and they'll be looking for a small decline in the overall hiring rate. They want to see things go down on a sort of regular basis, but not collapse. 260,000 is the forecast. They'd be fine with that. Unemployment not expected to change. Average hourly earnings down a little bit. So all in all, the market is expecting a kind of Goldilocks report. We'll see uh, if we get that. But again, it's the trend that matters to the Fed. And if they do see the fact the, the number of people who are getting new jobs declining in the the same way that they are, uh, we have seen over the past couple of months, then that's going to be a relatively good news sign for them. It doesn't mean they're going to change their views on what they're going to do for November, but it does mean that they'll feel like they're on the right track. Mike McKee, the Fed speak. Can we finish there? I wonder if it's driving you nuts yet. Evans, Cook, Kashkari, Waller, Mester, all today, even after the Fed speak we've already had. Is there anything left to be said? There's nothing left to be said, but the question is, do the markets get it? They're still hanging on to this Fed pivot idea, and as long as they are, the Fed's going to keep pounding away and say, we're not going to do that. You know, if you like jobless claims today, you're going to love jobless claims next week. Half of Florida's out of work. True. So, so we're going to have a monster rally on that basis. It's uncomfortable, isn't it, this bad news, good news thing? It's a dynamic I really don't like, Mike. Yeah. Just well, the Fed looks past it in the sense that this goes up and down every day, depending on the latest data point. Uh, Mary Daly made that point yesterday. The Fed is data dependent, and data is a plural word. 
Mike McKee, thank you. Equities up by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, up a half of 1%. Your trading diary, the events you need to be watching, up next. Five minutes into this, just about holding on to gains on the S&P 500, up around about a tenth of 1%. If you break it down sector to sector, energy names up again. Four days of this now, energy names on the S&P 500 over that period, up around about 14%. What a rip off the back of what's happened in the commodity market. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary, kicking things off with President Biden speaking at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Fed speak continues throughout the day. We get Evans, Cook, Kashkari, Waller, Mester and a whole lot more. Williams and Bostick going through to the end of the week on Friday. And the main event on Friday, it's Payrolls Friday, your payrolls report. It's just a few days away. In fact, it's less than 24 hours away. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on this Thursday, October 6th. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. It's your move, White House. OPEC Plus cuts production. Prices trade near 90 a barrel, and the White House needs a plan B. We're going to speak to Amos Hochstein, Special Presidential Coordinator for Global Infrastructure and Energy Security. Plus, you got a cooling labor market. Jobless claims, job cuts rise, while Fed officials still bang that drum on rate hikes. Markets still price in a cut for next year. And it's team minus 22 hours. Markets hold on until Friday's jobs numbers yield higher, equities mixed. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. And just to drive home that uh, rate hike versus cut scenario here, Kashkari is speaking uh, over the last hour. And he says uh, the bar to shifting our stance on policy is very high. It cannot get more clear than that. Absolutely not. But you do have to ask, Alex, are we in a position where the Fed can't signal a pivot until it's actually ready to deliver it? Because if it, if it signals it too early, financial conditions ease, and it kind of undoes what it's trying to do now. So I think there's a kind of cat and mouse game being played here as well. But as you say, the Fed speakers are almost unanimous in what they're saying. They're all singing from the same hymn sheet. They're basically signaling there is no pivot there is no pivot. That is the message, clear and simple. And the, the, they are basically doubling down on their commitments that rates are going to go higher. I'd like to reach a point where policy is moderately restrictive. I see us as raising to a level that we believe is restrictive enough. Somewhere between 4 and 4.5% 4 .5 by the end of this year and then hold at that level. Holding it there until we see inflation truly get close to 2%. You have to understand the limitation of your data. You have to understand the limitations of your models, but you still need to use them to base your policy decisions on. That's the Fed's view. Is the Fed wrong? That's our question of the day. Because that's certainly the signal we're starting to get from markets, isn't it? You take a look at what the pricing looks like next year. You've got a rate cut price. You've got two in 2024. Is the Fed wrong? Joining us now to discuss and try and answer that question, because I feel like it's the theme of the day, Bloomberg Intelligence Chief U.S. Rate Strategist Ira Jersey and Bloomberg's International Economics and Policy Correspondent Mike McKee. Ira, I'm going to start with you. Is that what the, the, the market is signaling right now, that the Fed is wrong? Well, yeah, I think the, the market doesn't believe that the Fed can hike up to, you know, four and a half ish percent plus or minus 25 basis points and then not cut soon. And when you look at some of the past hiking cycles, um, you've definitely seen about six months after the last hike, the Fed has generally started to cut. Now, th this time could be different, right? We and, and I actually think it will be different at some level because I think that the Fed will be more reluctant to cut interest rates this time unless there's some form of uh, significant slowdown in the economy. 
economy. And it's it's not a matter of of the the stock market going down a lot or credit spreads even you know being relatively wide compared to the recent past. But they really need to see the economy slowing enough that they're convinced that inflation will be relatively, mm -hmm. uh, relatively low. Mike, traditionally, who has it right, the Fed or the markets? <laughs> uh, what we've seen in the past is that both get it wrong. Uh, and it, markets are really concerned with timing. The Fed is concerned with outcomes. And so it's hard to marry the two things. And that's what's going on in this case is uh, markets want to see a more loose financial situation. They want to see um, some additional liquidity in the markets. They've gotten used to that. The Fed wants to see inflation going down. Now, the, what the market bet is telling you is people think that inflation will be going down sooner because the Fed is going to break something, the economy is going to swoon. The Fed is saying, we don't know that, that that's true, so we're telling you we're going to keep rates where they are until the uh, inflation rate starts to go lower. Now, if that happens to be March, then the Fed would pivot. If it doesn't, then they'll keep uh, rates where they are yep. until they see that happen. Mike, does a recession equal rate cuts? Uh, well, that depends on how you define recession. You know, there are people who said the first two quarters of this year were a recession. They weren't, but if you're looking at just a, a contraction in economic activity, it'll depend on why economic activity uh, went down. Now, if you're talking about something like unemployment going way up uh, because there is a recession, the Fed would probably be, be then cutting interest rates because they would have squashed demand, and demand uh, would mean that uh, prices are going down, inflation will be falling. Falling. So uh, the Fed's going to be watching all those indicators to decide. Uh, remember, the indicators are backward looking, too, so they may be a little slower than the markets anticipate uh, mm -hmm. going forward. Well, Ira, you know, I've been reading uh, overnight. It feels like everyone globally will be looking at the U3 rate tomorrow. Like, that's going to be the thing. <laughs> what is Goldilocks yeah. for U3 in your world? Yeah, so well, so, so I think Goldilocks, meaning that that you're going to wind up seeing like ten-year yields uh, start to fall. I think if U3 goes up by a couple of tenths, then uh, w without the participation rate going up a lot, then then yeah, that would be a situation where you'd probably see rates rally a bit. People would be more concerned that that Mike's uh, kind of bad case scenario that he just laid out there with with unemployment going up would be a big thing. You know, one of the one of the things that I've been asked a lot over the last couple of weeks, Alex, is is the uh, is there a Fed put like where is the the strike price of the Fed put and, and and I think that what what Mike just said is important because the the Federal Reserve at this point there is a Fed put but it's just way further out of the money than we've gotten used to you know for the last 35 years we're used to the stock market going down a lot that being a signal to the Fed that the economy is going to be poor and the Fed actually starts to cut interest rates and gets more dovish but in this environment that that Put is just way far out of the money because inflation now is the is where um, is is going to be the driver of the Fed's action. So so until the you, you wind up getting I think the uh, the the PCE index below three percent, the Fed put is just you know way way far uh, out of the money in terms of where the stock market or credit market has to go uh, for them to start cutting. Absolutely, and I think I, I think that is a that is a really solid point. But Ira, it also needs to be nuanced as well. And I'm wondering how the market reacts as we start to approach some of those key points and the Fed starts to slow down the rate of, uh, of hikes. So if we get the market going from, say, we get the Fed going from 75 to 50 to 25, does the market read those as pivots? And does, do financial conditions ease as we go through that process because the market almost overreacts? And how does the Fed manage that process? Well, I think that if the if the Fed does hike 75, 50, 25, and maybe another 25 in March, um, you know that's that's pretty much what's priced in the market right now. So I think that that uh, you know, assuming that the equity market and the credit markets are watching what's going on in, in my world, then uh, you know you should actually probably get very little reaction one way or the other. Uh, should that be considered a pivot? I think the answer is no. It shouldn't be considered a pivot because this is basically what they've told you. This is what the dots say. This is modestly mm -hmm. restrictive territory. Um, and in fact, you know, we've done some some work, and in some of our research recently, we've looked at what, uh, assuming that that the uh, consensus forecast for the headline PCE is correct, 
when will we reach zero federal funds rate? And remember, the Federal Reserve hikes interest rates, uh, has always hiked interest rates until it gets the Fed funds rate to equal the headline PCE. And that could happen as early as February or March of next year. Mm -hmm. And that would be a great outcome for the Fed. And they could say, look, look, we're at neutral right now, at proper neutral, and the uh, inflation rate continues to fall. So we're going to just keep rates here until we get to our, to our target. Um, and, and that shouldn't be considered a pivot. Now, could, could risk assets do well after that? Because the next move will almost certainly be a cut if that mm -hmm. does happen. Um, then, yeah, then, then I think financial conditions might ease a little, uh, it might ease a little bit, but probably not, uh, not, not a crazy amount. Right. So it's not a pivot. It's just policy. It's policy that worked is basically what you're saying. Um, before we go, guys, I just want to point out more of what Kashkari was talking about. He said the Fed's not trying to affect the dollar, but they do watch its impact. Um, Mike Mary Daly was talking about this before as well. Like they keep watching the stuff that's happening due to the Fed policy tightening, but they don't seem too scared about it. And I'm wondering when they get scared about it. Well, you know, with currencies, it's hard because the central bank doesn't have anything to do with the value of the dollar. That's set in the markets, and then the administration will decide whether it's gone too far uh, one way or another. But they do have to live with the consequences. Now, the consequences for the Fed are pretty good right now because we're exporting our inflation. Uh, it does make oil prices higher around the world, which uh, contributes to that uh, OPEC situation, OPEC plus situation. Uh, so they'd probably like to see it go down Maybe a little bit. Cable. But uh, so at this point, the Fed's not going to be uh, too worried about it because it's helping the U.S. economy more than hurting. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Really great roundtable to set us up for the next 24 hours. Mike McKee and Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you very much. So coming up, we're going to continue that conversation with Kim Forrest, Boca Capital Partners founder and CIO. Her thoughts on the question of the day, and then how do you invest? She's really looking at it from a company-specific level, likes the like of Intel as well as Coke. We'll break it down. This is Bloomberg.